LD Comics is a women-led, welcoming-to-all forum run by creators. We champion the graphic novel form, particularly works with an autobiographical voice. Our activity is towards supporting and equipping graphic novelists, especially, but not exclusively, people identifying as women. Established in 2009 by Sarah Lightman and Nicola Streeton as Ladies Do Comics, today LD Comics is run by a committee of published graphic novelists. Rachel Ball, Emma Burley, Lou Crosby, Wallace Eats and Nicola Streeton. From the start, the core of LDC's activity has been the monthly meetings, hosting presentations from invited guests to a public audience in a welcoming atmosphere for networking and making friends. The introduction of LDC Online Monthlies aims to replicate the joy and stimulation of our physical meetups. Everyone is welcome. That's, that's me, a little bit of myself, and this is what I'm talking about tonight. Um, I called it the Queen, the Prince, and the Crow because that's the way I'm using uh, my resources to communicate house stories. And my name is Marta Jepp. Um, so, who am I? Um, I am this little girl still sometimes, and I like to present it first with an illustration about you know, my biggest dream was living in London when I was 13 and I wanted to be best mates with uh, Chris Martin and have a great life with rock stars. But things turned out to be a little bit different. Um, but I, um, yeah, I'm Spanish. My uh, surname is pretty long and I decided to make myself Jeb as the uh, artistic surname. And initially, I wanted to become an illustrator, uh, well, yes, and a translator as well. Um, but life sent me to London, and instead of working for the you know, European Union or um, any other institution, I ended up working in teaching for nine years. And in 2020, I self-published my first book. I called it My Bright Little Universe. It had to do with the pandemic and how I lived it um, alone in my little flat in London. And uh, for the last four years, I've dedicated myself to creative mentoring, storytelling, and growing my creative business. Um, I quit teaching, by the way. And nowadays, I live in Lisbon with my partner, the techie, handsome man who helped me with this today, and run my creative home, which is called Mata Jeppa Studio. So that's me in a nutshell. And a bit about my heart story, I went from, uh, that's me on the left, being 23, not knowing what to do, not knowing what I really wanted, even though I studied translation, to the opposite, which is me nowadays, being an artist and owning it and being very, very happy in it and very confident. So the story goes here, it's uh, The Gap, and I called it Mind the Gap for obvious reasons, because I, I thought I was going to be something, but I was meant to be something else. And the story is everything that goes in between this gap. Um, so a bit of context, I moved to London in 2013 um, and I was pretty scared. I thought it wasn't going to be um, as smooth or exciting as I had pictured in the first illustration that I showed you. Um, and a little abstract, I, an abstract from my diary, it says, 10 years later, I'm here, and it feels different than I thought, and I thought I would be excited, but instead, I am cheating myself. Uh, what am I doing the right thing? Help. Um, and it felt really confusing. Um, and it created this sort of space that I didn't have when I was back in uni, focused on having really good grades and making the best. Um, you know, in my degree, and I, I had all these insecurities painting the blank canvas that London created. Um, and that gave uh, food to the queen. The queen is uh, my imposter syndrome, and it became a huge uh, ruler in my life for so many years. Um, I made a little sketch which represents my relationship with her and she says, hi, my name is Imposter Queen. 
and I think you're not good enough. How do you do? Um, I don't have a mouth and I did it on purpose because I felt like I couldn't say anything. I felt like she was in charge of that. Um, and she ruled my decisions. She, she ruled the way I perceived the world. And that became incredibly present during my first years in London, especially. We've known each other for some time and uh, her motto is, you're not good at anything. And uh, you can see that right now I have short hair. And back when I was 23, I had really long hair. So that was my way of using, um, uh, you know, techniques to portray my younger self and how she, you know, she takes me by the hand and she moves with me. Uh, well, she makes me move with her, basically. Um, a little bit more of her, uh, I describe her as the most evil, manipulative, limiting machine. Um, and every time I think I'm good at something, then she comes back and she's like, listen, you're not that good. So who do you think you are? Um, so she's, she's pretty sneaky and she comes in. Um, and in the story, uh, in the graphic novel that I create, um, she represents my inner critic voice. Um, I use her as a narrative tool to lead the way during the first half of the book. So she basically has the power of how the story goes and I follow. Um, I like to create her as a funny anti-hero. That's been something we've been talking with Wallace in the, in the circles uh, over the last few months. Um, because she's sassy, she's, you know, this cruel, very critical figure that you have, like, it makes me laugh in a way. Um, and I use a fun element to bring lightness and move the story forward instead of feeling stuck in triggers. Um, and this is a little vignette that I drew a while ago. Um, and I have some love handles are not really love handles and then she comes at me and she's like have you gained weight oh this is new you know she's like pointing little things of my insecurities um uh this leads me to the dark prince uh and this is the second element of the story um this dark prince is uh based on a store on a relationship that i had in in london um and this person is a projection of my imposter queen in real life. We we tend to be drawn either to our darkness or our light. So I played with that and it doesn't have a face. It doesn't have a real figure. We don't know exactly who this person is. And that's, that's the feeling I had in this relationship of this person of not really knowing. Um, I created um, a mix between the charming prince and, you know, like a shadow that is clouding my perception of who I am, my identity, and the choices that I make along, along the line. And as a resource, it helped me have freedom to create without guilt. Uh, I had a lot of guilt with, you know, is anyone gonna, uh, you know, feel offended, I'm going to offend, other things are going to be too real. So I decided to detach completely and create like a story of um, this figure that is, it is clouding my perception. So I take the power back to myself and I just uh, lead, let that lead the story. Um, and this is a little uh, illustration of my imposter queen who loves him so much. She thinks he is great, he's the savior, you know, and um, this is a little bit of, you know, how it goes in the story. She she leads the way, she says, don't worry, I'll lead the way, Prince Charming knows more than you do. And that's the way I felt uh, that, you know, I, I was so tiny in this big compass that was London. Um, I just let all the people uh, take the power and I, uh, and I, followed the queen's ruling. Um, and then on the on the second illustration, he's on a pedestal and I am absolutely worshiping this person. 
with his mask um, and she's, you know, very happy. She's like convincing me, this is your savior, isn't he charming? Just follow through with him, you know, um, you don't count kind of feeling. Um, I want to keep moving just because I'm aware of the time. Uh, but uh, if you see as well some aspects, I created this sort of chain with her. So, you know, I, I felt like I couldn't move anywhere. I felt like I was just following someone else's lead in physical and mental uh, reality. Um, and then life moves on, the story keeps going and I find the crow. So uh, the crow is the figure that frees me from the queen's chains that you've seen before. Um, it represents my inner wisdom and my higher guidance. I also used uh, a different language for the crow. So um, it's more poetic. It says, when you feel lost, do what you love the most and keep walking. And just, just in a very gentle and mysterious and wise at the, at the same time, intuition works in mysterious ways. And I played with that analogy. Um, and it brings healing and a sense of direction that I didn't have in the beginning of the story and there's a breakthrough and um, thanks to to the cross I keep moving um, a little remark on that it happened in real life so um, I moved to an area in North, North London I don't know those of you in London who know Hyde and it's very close to Ham Hampstead Heath um, so I would go to the Heath um, and I would go and cry and just like, and then there were many crows and there was just like a weird experience that I had. It was just like feeling like I was following crows uh, after I broke up with the Prince Charming. But it gave me that sort of sense of empowerment of like, oh, what do I need to do? I just like find my space and then move forward. So some of the things where, you know, okay, fine, that's great, you give me the guidance, but what's next, give, tell me what to do. And then the crow gives me power back and it's like, oh, well, you have an answer, so I just follow through. You, you know what to do, so just do it. And that's the second part of the story where I start um, following more and I've, you can see that I'm, I have a shorter hair, I have a voice, I have a dialogue, I'm finally finding my voice uh, in this gap and like little by little closing the gap between who I'm meant to be and who I thought I was going to be and finding peace. Um, and it's our final conclusion, the way I close the gap, I, I chose to do a little illustration of me just sipping my coffee, having my present, very happy and she would be like, oh, you're not that good. Who do you think you are to choose? you know, the artist's way to, to be an artist, be an illustrator, to do all of these things that you dream. Um, and then I answer back and I say, I do not care. Uh, and she's super shocked. It's like, how dare you say something like that to me? You know, I rule over you. You don't rule over me. Um, and the way I closed the gap was finding a dialogue with her. Like, I hear you. Maybe some things are not really true, but that's okay. Um, I'll follow my inner guidance, and maybe there's something that I learned from you. Um, and that's how I conclude my my story and I conclude this presentation as well. So um, I'm writing a graphic memoir called Lizards Discard Their Tales. Tales is spelt T-A-L-E-S on purpose. Um, and I'm going to go through this presentation, uh, just talk about the background of it a bit, show you some illustrations and uh, tell you where I'm at now. This is already six years in, in bubbling <laughs> and it's still bubbling. So another six years and we could be ready to go. So a bit of background. Now I've always painted, I've always drawn, um, but I had to have the dreaded day job. So I was a nurse or in care and professions until I retired. Um, in 19, 
89, I moved to West Cork in Ireland, where I still am now. And my um, my images became more and more graphic and I use lots of mixed media. So all these would be mixed media elements that I've made individually and put on in layers. Um, I was wanting to sort of change. I didn't know quite where I was going. And then I came across LD Comics, which was really serendipity because that helped me discover what I wanted to do a bit more. So um, I had started making a, a graphic, well, I can't call it novel, it's actually factual, so it's a graphic memoir. Um, and it was originally starting uh, in my childhood when I was about three, when we were in Cyprus. My father was in the RAF and it was uh, the tales that happened there. And we had to leave there fairly swiftly because of my mother's shenanigans, shall we call them. Um, we had to leave in disgrace. So uh, that's all covered in the book. So I got a bit lost here. It was the first time I've ever done this. So I did one-to-one um, -one mentoring. Well, Nic Nic Nicola did the mentoring and I did the other bit uh, with Nicola, which helped me very much get back on track. So this was um, done in watercolors. And this is my first ever sequential uh, thing I've ever done. And this was uh, telling the story of us coming back on the ferry in disgrace sort of almost all overnight we had to come back. And this is me at about four, nearly five. And I just was so aware of the tension on the that trip. And that was the beginning of a very dysfunctional childhood, which was will be depicted throughout this book. So the five pages I did on this particular part of it got shortlisted for the... LDC Graphic Novel Award, which was a bit of a surprise, nice one. So what did I do then? I decided to shelve it. I shelved it because I'd done the five pages. I was probably a bit miffed that I didn't win the prize, I was probably sulking. So I shel shelved the whole thing and it languished in my box of unfinished projects, which is massive. And um stayed there but it kept niggling at me so I brought it back out and I started again and started telling the story love swimming in Cyprus there was this one story about a pram which I won't go into the details but it was a fairly scary thing for a child and how when we got back our mother went back to Cyprus to find the lover that she'd left behind and so on and so forth but it was actually beginning to bore me a bit because I told my story to anyone who would listen for years and over and over to myself. So I was actually bored of telling my story and I just, it was just beginning to be a bit like, and then that happened and then this happened. So just then another nice bit of serendipity came across safe space for hard stories. Comes up to Wallace. Um, which is an amazing group, I have to say, all ages, all experiences, we're all telling our stories, we're all helping each other and supporting each other. So <clears throat> this made me think about it, and I thought, in that group you have um, little rooms where you go off, I can't remember the room, what you call it, not shut, I was going to say shut off rooms, so it's not shut off, is it? It's break off, breakout rooms, that's right. So you go into the little breakout rooms with smaller groups and I was within one of these groups, I just suddenly got a little flashlight and I thought, I actually want this to be more about my mother because she was very enigmatic to me. I only knew her for 14 years of my life because she um, she died very young at 37. Uh, she packed in her life for those 37 years, but I wanted it to be about her. I wanted to think of her and all her nuances uh, from an adult point of view and to try and get to know her. So that's that became a restarting point. So then so 
So my mum, she was very glam. She was definitely a party animal. This is just a sketch. Um, this is a, a finished piece. Um, so she was a party animal, definitely. She really parted. But there was other sides to her than that. She was found children very irritating. Um, we were to be seen and not heard. She, but having said that, she was a nurse herself and she was very practical and down to earth and ahead of her time with some ideas. Sorry, I'm going backwards. Sorry, my life. Here we go. Um, she also could be very cold, sometimes cruel. And she had a very, very sharp sense of humour, which could slice you in half, but at the same time could be very funny, especially when I look back now at my great age, um, it, I realise how funny it was. Sorry, my mouse has just died. So this is just, uh, sorry, I just want to go back to that one I just left because I knew um, what I realised in the making of this is I was doing an awful lot of, one page faces which was getting a bit repetitive so one of my um, notes to self at the moment is to change this up a bit make it more um, perspectives make it different pictures and so on so you, there's a lot of that at the moment but it's it's going to be evolving hopefully so this is an example of mixed media so this fabric this psychedelic sort of fabric is fabric from the 60s and this is uh we used to have cut out dolls i don't know if you remember them where you'd put paper dolls you put different clothes on them and that's just to show my mum as the glam woman she was and this side is the last time i actually saw her when she was in a hospital bed now she had been in that hospital for a lot and we were a bit blase about it it was almost par for the course but we didn't realize this was her last time because she actually had septicemia and um she didn't come out of the uh, theater but she even managed to tell me off here at this last point and looking back it was quite humorous the way she did it and she would enjoy the laughing about it herself now i think so <clears throat> I started moving away from the watercolours and using coloured pencils, which these images are made from. Um, I still like mixed media. So this one on the left is actually done in, in coloured pencils, but then cut out and put against a background um, and then a bit of photo editing. And I like the way that's got a shadow that's actually a real shadow from that cut out piece. Um, the one on the right is a picture of my mother who, as I said, she was, uh, she was, when she was ill, she was very strong, very resilient, very courageous. She never, she didn't complain as such, but she did rage. And this is her raging because she's just getting, just come round from and come home from one of her operations, her many operations and her stitches are broken down and she's, shouting at me who's like aghast in the doorway looking at what's coming out of the broken stitches and she's telling me to ring the effing doctor because next time she'll be asked to be woken up and she'll do her own stitches so that's tough lady tough lady strong lady uh a bit about how i kind of laid it all out putting it together like i said i went more into colored pencils i like the actual all the sort of color you can get out and I still haven't discovered them properly yet but they're amazing um also there's something very um it's almost like being a child again coloring in you know it's something nice about that so first of all I had all these memories like a tsunami of memories and it was very overwhelming and I try to think how is this going to come together so I started putting labels like chapter headings or section headings that didn't work for me because i'm i was still overwhelmed because i'm a visual person so i turned to ai 
which was a first, but it was interesting. So there's a little AI facility on Canva, which is my default um, workspace. And you just tell AI what you want it to draw and it draws it. Why do we bother? But as you can see, AI has its limitations. I asked it to draw my father. You descri I described my father and his daughter and we both ended up with mustaches, which is actually in our accurate because my moustache only happened a couple of years ago so that doesn't that that's inaccurate and as you can see this is a drawing with that I did with colored pencils on the right I'm not a bot and I think there's a big difference in the end of the day but as a placeholder AI is brilliant especially if you're a visual um person you know visual learner like me it just holds the place and it gives you a sense of what's coming and what's not. Okay. So, how? sorry, getting that, this seems to be jumping. So, talking about what this actually has done for me, all this process and all this, going through all these stories, and there is quite a lot of disturbing elements to it. What it, the biggest thing it's done for me is given me a relationship with my mother that's grown up. I can appreciate her as a woman. I can recognize and be proud of her strength, her resilience. I can enjoy her humor in retrospect. At the time when you're a child, it's not so funny, but in retrospect, I can enjoy it. I can forgive her now for all her foibles and she had some and they were big ones sometimes. But now I just think we're only human. She only had 37 years. I can forgive her. There's a there's a release in that. I can't say that I'm healed, but I can say that um I know my mother better, I think. But there again, you have to be aware that that is only imagination, some of that, in retrospect, isn't it? It's only looking back imaginative thinking, what if mum thought this, did that, or whatever. So what's next, to publish or not? We had a lot of discussion about this in Wallace's group. Uh, all of our stories are um, very personal and they're going to affect people. Well, mine is definitely going to affect people because there's a lot more stories behind what I've told you. And so I decided I'm not going to publish it. Um, which um, was a bit of a, you know, I had to think about that one quite a lot. When I first thought about it and how much it was going to upset some people, I was going to change my name. And then some of us in the group talked about this and we said, well, actually, by changing your name, you're, you're not owning your own story again. You're once again, you're burying it. So... I put it, I put my name on it, but I'll probably only have a, a couple of copies for immediate family. Um, so that is that. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Perks. I'm a published children's book author, illustrator. I'm a stop motion animator and puppet maker, a painter and an art educator. And although I did bill myself as a graphic novelist, um, I have to say really I'm an evolving graphic novelist. <laughs> so I've been working at it for a while and uh, um, you know, we'll see how things go. Um, here's some of my, I just wanted to show a, uh, just a sprinkling of some work. I do, I decided not to show any published books Although I did produce two books that were wordless books and um, they were very much in a graphic novel style or yeah, comic style. Um, so the one on the left is Armid, which is a, an oil painting. Um, the one in the middle is a little peek into my stop motion studio, which isn't really that big, but and one of my puppets, which is uh, partway done um, and a watercolor called The Boy. And uh, 
a lot of the work that I'm going to be showing tonight is uh, still at a drawing level. Um, and if I go back to here, this is actually an image of my safe space. Uh, it was one of the first things that we were asked when we joined safe space when it started up was to do a uh, a picture of our safe space and my memory was that uh, when my children when my girls were quite small still quite little i'd always i'd get up very early in the morning and i had this perfectly placed chair with books notebook coffee of course and a big window that looked out into the back garden. This is in California, so you wouldn't see a century plant here probably. And that was where I would sit for until somebody woke up, which sometimes I got a lovely hour and a half, sometimes only an hour, you know, but actually it was very good. And that's where I did a lot of my journaling and working through a lot of the emotions I was going through at the time and creative work. Um, what uh, my project is, it's an autobiographic fiction, I'm calling it that, um, and it's a dual narrative about traumatic loss and learning healing takes a long time. Um, and um, when I uh, joined Safe, Safe Place for Hard Stories, the, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that, or funny to me anyway, because I think, I think life does interesting things to you. Um, I had been thinking for many years about how I felt like I had a whole life that nobody knew. And I would always say I had four children, which I guess you could say I had five children, four of which I raised, one I did not. Um, and But I never mentioned that fifth child. And um, I, I always felt like I, wa I wanted to because it felt, it just felt like a whole. And, uh, but anyway, I saw this advertisement and it said, oh, um, join for, to he how I read it was, join to hear about how to tell hard stories. And I thought I was going to sit back and I was going to listen to people talk, or one person talk about how, how you could tell hard, a hard, a difficult story. And turned out I was then asked to put together a presentation which scared scared me <laughs> scared me quite a bit uh, but i did it and and i thought oh this is really weird this is like destiny coming in and so um so it was the first time i'd ever told anybody that story in fact recently my best friend said you never told me that story and that is true i didn't tell anybody um so it's an autobiographic fiction where two stories, uh, the other the other part of the story is I had been writing for years and some some of my crit buddies will, will remember seeing this off and on. Uh, I would a story that was a fantasy and um, it was a young girl going out on a quest and you know and um, what I realized in the midst of all this, <laughs> it took me about a year that the story was really two stories. And um, so this is an autobiographic fiction where two stories run alongside, col collide and change Elaine's life forever. Evelyn and Elaine's story, and I, of course I, I really took on board the fact that I have named my character, that is me, a different name. Um, but it kind of feels right because it's fictionized, I guess. I mean, it's, it's two stories. It's real and fantasy next to each other. Um, one, is, one is on a quest in a fantasy world that um, uh, I got I can't see um, that uh, that begins with a strenuous journey alone in the wilderness, and Elaine's journey begins when she realizes she's pregnant at sixteen. Um, this is the fantasy. Uh, this is the how I envisioned that the village could be very whimsical. River runs through it in the valley, and within the valley are the people I call the people of the sun, and in the mountains are the the people of the wolf. And um, and I did I I did actually did almost ten pages on this fantasy idea, but I'm only going to show you one sequence. 
And when Elaine is, goes on her quest, she has to go through this dangerous landscapes of flesh eating trees and low lying poisonous gases. And, uh, and she does meet a very charming, uh, charismatic young uh, man who uh, she feels is taken in by and that that's where Elaine and her stories do start to really marry up um but here she's in the forest with the flesh-eating trees and she goes to pick up I don't have to explain it to you you can see it and uh the um the last piece then <laughs> you could see the trees eating the the poor squirrel um this is some initial um uh, sketches well i've done a lot of sketches of elaine slash evelyn evelyn is the wolf girl everything that elaine feels she isn't she's strong she's brave she's a fighter uh or at least elaine feels that she's not that and um sorry anyway um Evelyn is, um, uh, they, they look alike. I thought, I thought about that because of course they are the same, uh, but Evelyn is all the strong parts. Um, in Evelyn's world, it consists of two peoples, <clears throat> those who are of the sun and who are of the wolf. And her story is one of betrayal, redemption, and salvation. And uh, a big part of uh, what I would call the fantasy and magical realism that I want to integrate into this story is that many cultural stories hold the lore of the shapeshifter, one who can change from human to animal to bird or fish and back to human, and some choose to remain animal. Um, Elaine's journey takes her through life, threatening choices that lead to consequences and are tragic consequences and what it is to be a mother. There are hints of magical realism and themes of identity, shame, um, and that just the feeling of not belonging anywhere. Evelyn and Elaine will learn about the wolf within them. And that's something that's become clear to me as I work with the story is that I, at one point I thought the, the wolf was separate, but I'm seeing that the wolf is part of everything. Um, this is some of the parts of the real story. Uh, my, I suffered from an eating disorder. Um, so I was very thin. Um, I, can't, I think I was less than 100 pounds. And when I uh, was full term, I was 125 pounds. And uh, this is baby. Uh, when I had... Um, when I had him, uh, they did uh, uh, little Polaroids that you took home, you know, so this is this is from a Polaroid of him from the hospital. And, uh, and you know, it, 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 even though things do go quite disastrous, <clears throat> um, it is, um, there were fun times and this is what I, I wanted to show that it wasn't just a mixture, you know, that there were um being a young mother i um uh, or child mother one would say um I, I, I there were lovely times and um this was a uh, bit of story that i'm doing or because i decided to work in four page segments because i thought it works really well with the whole idea of memory and how memory can be quite fragmented because i don't remember everything um for various reasons and um this is a uh time where we went out to meet a friend at the beach uh she was my best friend at the time and um unfortunately uh, this is before you had phones you know that told you where to go i got lost i didn't get off at the right station but these nuns got on the bus and i thought i was safe hey the nuns know where they're going and but unfortunately, uh, the, in this case, the nuns started to climb out the windows and fly away and turn into birds. So um, 
in the real story, I do eventually find my friend, just in case you're wondering, but uh, I just, that, that feeling of um, just not knowing where I was going and, and, you know, being so young with a, with a baby, I think he was nine months old there. Um, in the fantasy in the real, this, uh, he represents the young man that I meet um, and Evelyn meets in the woods. Very, like I said, charming, charismatic. I just thought so intelligent and creative, all, all the things that, you know, and I left the, my baby's father for him. And he's also the wolf. Um, when worlds collide, the um, I wanted to show images of how the worlds began to collide. And this is an image of the forest coming into the the dining, you know, where uh, where the fruit plate is and how the pears are turning into the poisonous fruit. And it really very much represents how um, how I at the time I didn't know that he suffered from bipolar and because what did I know at that age and uh, and everything got very violent and just um, uh, undependable um, so uh, things got very hard and I got into the habit of um, to protect my son I kept putting myself in uh, in the way. Um, and um, I think for the most part, I, it helped. Um, but um, the, the way this story is going to work through, uh, we, because um, what I would say about safe place is there's always something that we deal with, a, a moment or something in our hard story. And this is the moment I drew that I know will be in my book, which is, that moment where I'm laying in the tub because I had been beaten and I just every part of me hurt and um, and I just hear he's not breathing and then and then after that I just have like snippets of like snapshot pictures and um, anyway. Um, so uh, that that will uh, lead to the next parts of the story. Um, that will eventually lead to I will I end up um, realizing that I didn't have the capacity to take care of them or to protect them, and I made the hard decision that uh, adoption was the best option. Um, so, Evelyn and uh, Elaine's journeys lead them to understanding that the wolf lives within, and knowing that can lead to forgiveness and healing takes a long time. Uh, and I, I was trying to decide on what I would be a cover for this. And, and it, I wanted to do this combination of the wolf as being part of me too, and, and, and the child within. Um, the, uh, um, and uh, I'll go on to here. This is my, um, my, this is what I look at in front of me every day while I'm working on this. Just lots and lots of drawings and, and more that I need to add that I will be adding as I go. Um, I have a really lovely crit group and, uh, and, and also Safe Stories has been so instrumental in really helping me work through how the, this uh, story is going to evolve, how I'm going to be able to tell it. And um, the um, and basically, uh, let me see if I actually said something. Well, okay, yeah. The um, I'll go back to this for a moment. Um, the when I was young, I buried myself in books, so I thought if, if the fantasy story is very is the older Elaine or the older me writing this story, and the story will be. Um, is given, if you will, to the younger um, Elaine and uh, bringing a nice circle uh, through the whole thing. Because, um, you know, the one thing I really struggled with has how do you how do you end a story? How do you put a satisfying ending to something that doesn't really have an ending till way past the 15 months that I had my son? Um, 
because I'm 68 and I'm just now talking about it. So this, you know, and uh, it's, um, you know, and it, and that really made sense uh, to, to do something like that. And I have both safe space and my uh, crit group to thank for those ideas. Um, and that brings me back to safe space and, um, to, you know, just how important it is to have a, a place. Um, uh, so I'm, um, I, I feel very strongly uh, moved to tell this story because I felt like I, it was just quiet and not told for so many years. And, um, and to feel safe to finally feel like I can actually really do it. It's been really important. So the safe space group has been really important to me. So, uh, yeah, so thank you, as, as it says on the slide. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs>